Before getting to the main topic of this video, I wanted to say that this is the third part in a series on the standard model of particle physics. If you haven't seen the other videos, I would highly suggest watching those first, since I'll be referencing ideas and topics from those videos in this one. I'll leave links to those videos along with the full playlist in the description below. Anyway, on to the video. Much of the early progress in quantum mechanics was done to gain a better understanding of the physics of atoms and their nuclei. This included the studies of electron energy levels, nuclear structure, and of course splitting and fusing nuclei. It had also been known since the late 19th century that certain types of nuclei are capable of radioactive decay in several different ways. One of these ways in particular, known as beta decay, led to a very interesting, and at first very worrying, discovery. During a beta decay, a radioactive nucleus emits a charged particle to change its own charge and mass. When this emitted particle was studied more closely, it was discovered that it had the same properties as the previously discovered electron. So the picture of beta decay at the time was that the nucleus simply emits a single electron, increasing its charge by one unit of electric charge, and changing its mass by a bit. But how much is a bit? When we look at the mass of a nucleus before and after it decays, we see that the initial nucleus is actually heavier than the combination of the nucleus after decay and the electron. For example, cesium-137 with a mass of about 136.9071 atomic mass units beta decays to barium-137. The combined mass of the decay products is about 136.9063 atomic mass units. Where does this extra mass go? Well, we know from special relativity that mass is just another form of energy. So if the final state particles after beta decay are moving, this loss of mass can be accounted for by converting it to kinetic energy. Now here's where things get interesting. The mass of the electron is much, much less than that of the radioactive nuclei which undergo beta decay. In the previous example, both the initial and final nuclei have a few hundred thousand times the mass of the electron. In a case such as this, it's a straightforward kinematics exercise to show that, to conserve momentum and energy, the lighter particle should carry away almost all of the kinetic energy. So, if we were to measure the energy distribution of a bunch of electrons which are being emitted via beta decay of a single type of nucleus, we would expect to see a very sharp peak sitting at the mass difference between the initial and final states of the decay. This type of experiment can of course be done, and it was. However, the results were shocking. Instead of seeing the expected sharp peak in the electron energies, a smooth, broad curve was actually detected. So what the heck is going on? Is conservation of energy completely broken? This isn't even the end of the problems. It was also found that when a nucleus beta decays, its spin is only allowed to change by an integer value. But we know that the electron is a fermion, which has half integer spin. Since spin is tied to angular momentum, it would seem that beta decays also violate the conservation of angular momentum on top of apparently violating conservation of energy. This problem, first discovered in 1911 by Liza Meitner and Otto Hahn, persisted for roughly two decades without resolution. That was, of course, until 1930 when Wolfgang Pauli proposed an interesting solution. All of this discussion has been based on the assumption that only a single particle is emitted during beta decay. So what if there is another particle which is emitted? If this is the case, then this new particle must satisfy several properties. First, its mass must be very small in order for the final state of the decay not to exceed that of the initial state. We now know that the mass of this particle is actually far smaller than that of the electron, less than a million times smaller, in fact. Second, this new particle must not carry electromagnetic charge, otherwise the detectors searching for charged decay products like electrons would have seen them. This doesn't necessarily mean that it cannot interact with matter, after all photons carry no electric charge and they can easily interact with electrons, However, the fact that it had not been detected suggested that, on top of being electrically neutral, this particle interacts incredibly weakly with matter. 
In fact, it must interact so weakly that Polly himself feared that it could not be detected. Finally, it must be a spin one half fermion in order to conserve angular momentum in the decay. Polly's original name for this new particle was the neutron, however, the name didn't quite stick since at a similar time it was discovered that another electrically neutral particle, this one with a mass very similar to the protons, lived in the nuclei of atoms. Since this other particle shared so many similarities with the proton, it was natural to refer to this one as the neutron, and Enrico Fermi renamed Polly's particle to the neutrino. Okay, so now we have a new picture of beta decay. An unstable nucleus decays, emitting both an electron and a neutrino, right? Well, almost. We have to be a little careful. In my first standard model video where I talked about symmetry and quantum electrodynamics, I mentioned that fermions are mathematically represented by objects known as spinners, and in order to preserve the symmetries of special relativity, spinners must always be paired up with conjugate spinners. Without getting too deep into the gory details, it turns out that the spinners can be interpreted as either incoming fermions or as outgoing antifermions. Similarly, the conjugate spinners can be interpreted as incoming antifermions or outgoing fermions. All of this is to say that if we have two spinners in the final state of our system, like in beta decay with the electron and the neutrino, one must be a regular particle and the other must be an antiparticle. So if we know that during a beta decay an electron is emitted, then we know that the other particle emitted must be an antineutrino. If instead we had a beta plus decay, where a positron or anti-electron is emitted, we know that a standard neutrino is also emitted. There is a caveat to this. Since the neutrino is uncharged, there is a possibility that it is in fact its own antiparticle similar to the photon. A fermion which is its own antiparticle is known as a Majorana fermion. Whether or not neutrinos are Majorana fermions is still an unsolved question, still being explored today. A few years after Pauli's proposal, Fermi suggested that beta decay is caused by either protons or neutrons emitting positrons and neutrinos, or electrons and antineutrinos respectively, converting the proton into a neutron, or the neutron into a proton. Note that since neutrons are slightly more massive than protons, a free neutron will always decay into a proton, electron, and antineutrino, but a free proton will never decay into a neutron, positron, and neutrino. However, within a nucleus, a proton can decay in this way if the resulting nucleus as a whole is less massive than the original. If particles can decay in this way, variations of this interaction should also be possible, if energetically allowed. For example, it should be possible for a proton to absorb an antineutrino, converting the proton to a neutron and emitting a positron. The positron and the neutron would have clear signals which could be detected. So if we had a large source of antineutrinos, such as from beta decays within a nuclear reactor, and a target with a lot of protons, like the hydrogen atoms in water molecules, then we could feasibly design an experiment which would be capable of directly detecting these antineutrinos. This was exactly what was done in 1956 in the cohen rhinus experiment, which was the first experiment to directly observe a neutrino. This was no small feat due to the unimaginably tiny rate of interactions that neutrinos have with matter. With the experimental discovery of the neutrino, it was successfully added into the standard model of particle physics. However, this isn't quite the end of the story. As we'll see in future videos, it turns out that to be consistent with the standard model symmetries and without adding in any experimentally unverified particles into the standard model, this neutrino, which participates in beta decay, must be massless. In my other video on neutrinos, I discussed how we know that this cannot be the case in nature due to the measurement of neutrino oscillations, meaning that this incredibly difficult particle to detect may be one of our best chances to find new physics beyond the standard model. The neutrino is a critical addition to the standard model of particle physics. Looking at beta decays and other neutrino interactions made it possible to construct and experimentally verify the weak interaction a brand new fundamental interaction never before considered. The details of this are topics for later videos in this series,
but for now we can be content with the promise held within this tiny elusive particle. <laughs>